Let me uh, turn it over. I'm going to actually invite my panel members to come up here. Um, so Deshaun Grace from Ideas42, which um, I'd love to hear a little bit about who are you and what is Ideas42? Uh, okay, testing, making sure you can hear me. Uh, beautiful. So hi, my name is uh, Deshaun Grace. Born and raised in Oakland, California. I think that is very important to start off with because that city and my experiences there has shaped all yeah. Yeah. that I have. Okay. Um, has just shaped my perspective as a social justice warrior. Um, so I currently work for an organization that is called Ideas Break Two. Uh, we are the leading experts in the area of behavioral science, uh, specific, specifically for uh, social impact. And a lot of the work that we're doing now, he specifically, is around community building um, and power building. So figuring out what can we do uh, in the areas of narrative, changing narratives um, in Oakland uh, to create more social policies that eliminate poverty. And also, what can we do in the civic engagement space uh, with partners such as NAACP to increase uh, voter participation. And also, uh, started a nonprofit, Move with Race, which is based in similar work, but uh, more rooted in community to figure out what can we do to be in partnership with folks, um, developing tools and making sure that people are authentically empowered to be in the spaces where we have historically been excluded. We have learned uh, over the years that the folks who are closest to the problems are the best uh, suited to provide the solutions. And so uh, in order to fill that gap, there's a lot of, of um, things and structures that need to be in place, better infrastructure. So, uh, yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Alicia Barragan. Hi, good morning, everyone. When I said this, open up yes. Um, my name is Alicia Barragan. I'm originally from Yuma, Arizona. Um, I'm an immigrant ch uh, child from immigrant parents, and obviously part of the agricultural uh, history and legacy of my parents. Um, my hometown, second hometown, is Mountain View, and I've been very honored to be part of the GBI program. I am a GBI coordinator with Community Services Agency, and we're part of the implementation team to roll out the Elevate Mountain View. So I was very honored when they called me to be part of this uh, program that was new to the area and to lay out the framework. So I'm very blessed that we've actually worked with great partners, City of Mountain View, University of Pennsylvania, and uh, Mayor's for Guaranteed Income. So I've learned so much, and I was just telling one of our members, Julie, that it's come full circle for me to see um, how a child of an immigrant parent uh, could be so powerful in this type of setting, and how we could circle back and to give back to those who um, didn't have a system set up for them. So I think I'm very, uh, I'm very honored to be like a lot of people from the Fondo de Solidaridad, um, you know, trying to invest back in our community is key for me now. And uh, thank you for allowing me to be part of this today. Good morning, everyone. I'm Margaret Abicoga. I'm a council member here in the city of Mountain View. So welcome to our fair city. Um, I was in my, in my fourth term of 15 years on the city council. And I too, uh, like Alicia, uh, is, uh, I'm a daughter of um, immigrant working class immigrants um, with limited uh, English skills. So I was my parents' translator as soon as I learned English as, as a three, three to five year old. And um, so for me, it's, uh, I, through that, I learned how important it is uh, to have a voice in our community. Uh, my parents really didn't have one. And so that's what I've strived to do um, to be able to help provide a voice, make sure that everyone, regardless of their background, has a voice in our community. Um, I was mayor uh, in 2009 during the Great Recession, and back in 2020 during the pandemic. So some people call me the crisis mayor. Um, it was actually during 2020. Um, obviously, you know, very unusual, hopefully once in a lifetime opportunity, but despite the challenges, it offered us some silver linings and opportunities, and one was to be able to um, uh, introduce the Guaranteed Basic Income Program, um, and so I'm very uh, honored and, and grateful and, and proud to have been able to do that and appreciate the support from the community. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So, so, Margaret, the first question is actually to you because you you started off this, and I'd like to frame this. There's a 
there's two terms that we throw around universal basic income and guaranteed basic income. And I would love to get a definition of the difference between the two and why Mountain View actually selected a guaranteed basic income approach. So uh, universal basic income, uh, by definition, I looked it up, big sure, um, is a, a, you know, basic income uh, regardless of your background. So in a community, everybody, regardless of your income levels, would receive a certain amount of funding monthly or, 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 or um, some regular amount. Um, guaranteed basic income is uh, more tailored to um, uh, populations that um, uh, I guess you could describe it as uh, more in need. So there is a, I guess you could call it means testing to it. Um, and the reason why we picked uh, GDI, frankly, was just the practicality. Um, how we came about doing this was um, during COVID, um, all cities received uh, funding from the federal government, so COVID relief funding to help the cities um, continue to operate. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud of Mountain View. We have a very financially sound and strong community. So even during COVID, it was a little unbelievable, but we ended up with surpluses in our budget. And so this funding that came out to be $15 million over two years was really um, sur surplus on top of that. And um, as mayor at that time, my real interest was to figure out ways to get assistance out to the community as quickly and as directly as possible and to those who frankly needed the needed it the most and so um, that was it was really just the circumstances frankly um, we had this uh, pot of money um, wanted to get it out to folks as quickly as we could um, it wasn't enough for everybody um, so who should we give it out to we chose to um, so select the 30% AMI, so the extremely low income uh, category. And that's really how it was. Fantastic. Um, Deshaun, if I could put you on the spot. Mountain View obviously put, went for a guaranteed basic income approach. In your work, are you seeing other communities do similar approach? Or are they, you know, Mountain View, Margaret just referred to the ARPA dollars that came in, the other resources. Are others thinking about this, or are they simply just not interested in this kind of approach? Uh, absolutely. So, one, uh, um, Mayor Michael Tufts um, and Stockton actually introduced this for pretty much everybody. And since, was that 2019? Yeah, since about 2019, this program uh, started to take off, and they discovered a bunch of groundbreaking um, found findings uh, related to behavioral science, just the impact of having non-restricted funds and the space, it's the spaciousness that allowed the folks to actually navigate the different difficulties that they were experiencing. And so uh, since then, mayors have come together uh, to introduce pilots across the U.S., specifically California, and Oakland is considering for it is currently in the process of doing the same thing. And so, yes, we do see folks are adopting the idea and wanting to push it forward. Um, it is unsustainable to do a universal basic income at this moment because we need federal funding. Um, so the guarantee is our way of simply um, proving right, the concept and the benefit that it has to families for generations to come. And the beautiful thing about this um, is that there are a lot of narratives that feed the receptiveness around this entire project. Right? Like folks, um, something that we tend to forget is that we're all human and we all have a bunch of stories that feed into who we are on a daily basis. So I do a lot of work around narrative change because of this. Right? There are limited beliefs that we have um, when it comes to the idea of offering money to folks as income support is realistic. And unfortunately, because of that, there's this notion of you didn't work for it, you didn't earn it, and I am reluctant to offer this money to you because uh, you're going to squander it. That's not the case. So the thing about behavioral science and ideas 42 is this idea of scarcity. Like scarcity is a real thing. Scarcity mentality is a real thing. Um, there it is almost a byproduct of growing up in a constant relationship to poverty. Poverty is a result of a system of flaw, right? We can't blame people for being born in wherever caste system if you were they were born into. We woke up here, you know. So um, in that way, in that way, um, 
There is a cognitive bandwidth test that happens when you are experiencing scarcity, which is to say you can't think extensively beyond a particular moment. These are psychological terms, scarcity, tunnel vision, um, limited attention, all these things that speak to uh, just the inability to be able to function at a high complexity when you are being stressed in many different areas. And that's something that we tend to forget. What we also tend to forget, and I'm not I'm trying to go to ten, so forget it. <laughs> but what we, what we also tend to forget is how scarcity is triggered by trauma. Or if you grow up in an impoverished neighborhood, you're exposed to trauma on a consistent basis. And you are entering, if we want to be scientific, very, we're entering like flight, fight, freeze response. That has uh, a recovery time. If you aren't allowed to have that recovery time, you're stunning. Your growth is stunning. The way that you function, all the chemicals in your body are all geared towards uh, protecting itself. It, it's in survival mode, literally. That has an uh, implication on cognitive development over years. Epigenetics is a real thing as well. It actually changes your DNA. These are all things that are very important when we think about scarcity, and specifically the UBI, the uh, guaranteed, excuse me, basic income approach in these programs, because it offers what we call slack, the space to recover. <laughs> that's a different use of slack than the one that I, I love that that's uh I, I have more tangent questions for you but i'll hold off uh alicia i'd love to hear i mean the the program just launched um so if you can give us a quick overview where what does it look like right now who are the clientele that you, that csa serves yeah, absolutely. Uh, the GPI program did launch in uh, December of last year. So we're in month five at this point. Yeah, uh, month, five, uh, month five. So it's looking pretty great. I, we have, CSA has um, amazing clients because what happened, well, let me go back. University of Pennsylvania did select uh, clients or uh, recipients based on the lottery system. They only were able to select 166 clients. Um, of those, over 100 were already CSA clients, which were part of the community. So we already have the built-in trust with our community where it was easier for us, and I think we were blessed that, you know, it was nice to have that, that face to the name. So we got to see them, um, you know, uh, face, just face to face. Uh, but what it is now is that they are receiving $500 a month in, uh, for the next two years. Uh, so what the, some of the clients have shared with me is that some of them have already um, allowed that help to move, to allow them to move to a bigger apartment. And we know that rent is pretty high in this area, in this Bay Area. And so we do have like multi-generational families that share like a studio, that share one bedroom. And so a lot of them, are able to get that money, move to a one bedroom perhaps, and it's a little bit more space. Uh, some of them have quit their third job and they're spending more time with families. And um, there's some clients that for the first time in December when they got their first um, stipend, the first grant, they were able to, to go to Missona, the Christmas lights for the first time. Mm -hmm. So those are little things that we take for granted. Like even a family of five cannot afford to go to a movie theater as many of us wanting to be able to go once in a while. So those little changes, of course, it undoes the trauma what Deshaun is talking about because we grow up in, in that type of environment as children. And um, I speak for myself, you know, you grow up and you go anywhere and as a child you hear you're like, you know, there's no money. So you already have that innate, like there's no, there's scarcity. And so it's wonderful to see that parents are spending more time with their children, with their children now. Um, they are no longer expecting their child, their, for example, their teenage child to bring in contribution to support the family. So that child can go back to school full time and not worry about taking care of their parents and their family. So it, it has a, a residual effect on the line that this is, this is helping them, not as a handout, but it's getting them out of poverty and it's giving them a hand up. So it's wonderful to see that um, in our clients when I see them face to face, running to them in the mercado, they're very happy because they didn't realize that they could be helped by a simple acknowledgement, here's some help for you. So I, I see that changes already, already 
changing lives, it modified. I am excited to see what happens within the next two years. So, thank you. There was something happening in Stockton. How does a city learn of this idea? How does the community signal to the city, the elected official, that this is an idea that's important? Or in this case, did the elected officials actually say to the city itself, to the residents, we think this is important? I'm kind of curious about the origin, kind of like the thought process and how this kind of a, as a policy started to become formed. So thank you. Um, my understanding, and, and I was actually just in Washington, D.C. last week and tearing all of the, um, the monuments during cherry blossom season is beautiful. My, and my favorite is um, Martin Luther King Jr. And um, if you go back, he, he talks about it back in his um, speeches back in 1967. So it's not a concept that's necessarily new. Uh, but yes, Michael Tubbs uh, started it um, in Stockton. Um, frankly, I personally just got interested in it because, um, uh, was it 2020, Andrew Yang was running for president and he started talking about universal basic income and so um, I started to look into it and research it and um, what I, I really uh, I like about it, as mentioned, is um, it's giving people the opportunity or the empowering people to help themselves. And um, you know, I've been doing this, as I said, for 15 years on uh, council, two years before that on school board. And um, you know, government has a way of doing things. Um, and it's very difficult sometimes to break out of the mold. Uh, but I guess that after doing it for so long, I just was looking for ways to innovate, frankly. And um, the opportunity came because of this ARPA funding. And so, um, it was just like, well, here we have this pot of money again. Um, how can we uh, do something, try something different? Um, personally, you know, I'm kind of, I'll be straight up, I'm kind of tired of our patriarchal system. Um, I think it's important to you know that as a woman of color, um, that, you know, we, we, we don't need, right, we don't need other people to tell us how to improve our lives. I think we can figure it out ourselves best. And this was that opportunity to give folks that, that, that power to, to, to fight for themselves. Um, and, the, and some of that, that we're, we're seeing um, with our program early on, um, we uh, hit up some barriers where um, with the $500 a month, and just to put it in context, we are, uh, the, the participants are in the 30% AMI range, which is about thirty dollars to $40,000 a year income. So it's $500 at 6000 it's about 20% more. So it's, you know, I think uh, a substantial amount of funding. But um, we discovered that if they took this, they would have, that they'd, have, they'd be kicked out of CalFresh or some of these other programs. And so we had to go seek waivers from the county and the state to to let the, the participants continue. And um, you know, the challenge with these programs are they're very specific, they're needed, of course, whether it's food or you know, other types of assistance, but it's very restrictive. And here we, we just wanted to provide a little bit more income for folks to be able to decide, and as Alicia mentioned, um, you know, I, I was reading about you know, it's di buying being able to buy diapers for their kids. Or last night, I actually presented in Sunnyvale about GBI and um, our counterpart to CSA there, um, the C uh, CIO, was mentioning how a family was able to um, buy portraits, graduation portraits, for their daughter for the first time. So that's what it is, or whether it might be medical bills, or your car breaks down, and you can actually fix it to get to work. So. That's the flexibility that we're trying to offer um, so folks could decide for themselves how to improve their lives. So it's really, it was just, you know, and we hadn't, to be honest, heard from the community. We heard from the community that there was need and the people needed help. And it was just trying to figure out how to get that out quickly. And I guess just from, you know, seeing what was going on and my wanting to try something new, um, we, I introduced this program. <laughs>
Fantastic. Thank you. Margaret, some of the comments you just made remind me of the old, and I mentioned this to, we had a little bit of a pre-meeting um, uh, session yesterday, um, but reminds me of the, the debate around uh, food stamp programs going back several decades, um, and the intentionality around that program in really fencing how you could actually use resources. Um, the counter example here where you're actually giving people the dignity to choose is tremendous and I would just like to acknowledge and applaud that um, I think that is uh, a testament to a really sound policy approach in giving people the, the ability to actually determine how they actually want to use resources as well Deshaun you look at you want to jump in on that or I just want to commend you both of you uh, to be in a position that you all are, both of you are in, to have the stories that fed into who you have become, it's important for people like you to be where you are. Because, yeah, that is, that's my personal opinion. Okay. Um, uh, the thing is, the way I see guaranteed basic income, um, it adds something that rights wrongs. I mean, we could look at history. We all know what systemic racism is. We don't need to like introduce it to the room, um, but we understand how you know redlining, for example, has created a lot of in inequalities that we see today. So there is a track record that leads to where we are. So people are starting in a deficit. So in this way, this income support is needed, and a lot of times it isn't really giving folks power, but it's removing the blockers that are disrupting the power that they already have. And one thing that we've seen in Oakland is. Uh, there's a, a certain relationship between community and organizations, but specifically community and government. And there's a little reluctance here, rightfully so, right? Uh, we're talking about trauma. Right? Trauma is triggered a lot, moment to moment. <laughs> but um, when we talk about a community that has been you know, consistently disappointed, uh, trauma is that much more hypersensitive when I'm experiencing extractive practices from people who are not invested in the well-being of my family, okay? So when it comes to uh, government open being able to actually get community input, uh, there have been some struggles. Uh, we developed this thing called Trusted Messengers Model, which is nice that you mentioned having trust. How important that is to actually be able to uh, even get in the room with someone, let alone to create a safe space where people can be transparent and um, have a conversation that reaches depth to reach the problem. If we stay at the surface level, we'll never get to the core of the issue. It will always be a band aid solution. And you need the people here to be able to actually uh, navigate that space. And so, to make the story short, uh, what we've done at Ideas 32 around um, changing the narratives that surround poverty, we've created this, this approach that allowed for us to work in partnership with community. And it's not just a matter of saying, hey, come be a part of this program at this part so you can participate and then you leave. But no. The entire process from start to finish involved uh, having tools embedded in it. So folks are walking away with the ability, not the, excuse me, they're walking away with refined muscles because they already have the ability. We're not giving them nothing, it's already there, right? Um, they're walking away with refined practice and ability or muscles um, around identifying narratives, around dissecting it behaviorally, and then being able to create a counter narrative. Now that's something that's groundbreaking and open simply because there's always been a void between uh, community and government relationships. And so when I hear this and I hear the need to speak to community and even, uh, you said not a hand out, hand up. Hand up. That is literally one of the counter narratives that came from our conversations. It's as if you were there. Yeah. But that speaks to something, right? Like, that we are having shared experiences and that's powerful to know. It took us, I mean, <laughs> so many conversations to really understand the genius that is already embedded in community. To understand that real life experience is expertise. You don't need credentials necessarily to be an expert. You don't need a stamp. Not to disrespect anybody that has it. I'm glad that you have it, we do need it. But we also recognize that there's value in having real life experience. And to see the community kind of transfer and use each other's genius to reach these narratives and if that be one that came of it, wow, it's just such a, a life-giving experience. So I just want to offer that help and I'm glad that you all are where you are. Thank you. Uh
the greatest five you single that I have one more question to ask, although I'm so tempted to ask lots more. Um, Alicia, tell us what should we look forward to with this pilot program now? And what should be the next step for after the pilot program ends? What should a community actually try to achieve, if it's possible? Well, that's a big, yeah, that's a big question, but a I, question I think done. that's a great question. Um, I think what we're looking to achieve is obviously resiliency within the, the company. I think a lot of, uh, within the community, I think a lot of our recipients um, have uh, felt so lucky that they were the chosen ones. I think we had over two, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, 2,000 applicants wanting to apply for this GBI. So to them, when they show up at CSA and they say, I am so grateful I got selected, it's a sign, and a lot of them are very, uh, they have a lot of faith and say, you know, uh, the speaker wants me to do something with this. So I do see that you're empowering the people that receive this money. A lot of those participants, we actually have one, uh, one of our TBI recipients here, she is on fire. And in a way, it's like a lot of our participants want to go back to school. They want to get back to the community. So to them, the gratefulness is there. So you're kind of sowing a seed, and thank you so much for being the firework that started this. You're sowing the seed into the community, and it's getting them empowered. You're building your, your community with one another. You're building the trust, what you were talking about, Michelle. You're building, you, you kind of feel that energy here. And I was so, um, you know, coming from a different community, I see the difference in Mountain View, that everybody collaborates with each other. Everybody's so respectful. Um, we all say, you know, whatever you need, I'm here. And so you, you, you kind of fed that seed to those 166 participants that some of them even have offered to volunteer at CSA. Mm -hmm. Some of them have even donated to our Christmas funding. Mm -hmm. And because they feel like they were blessed with abundance, they, they give back. So what I see from now is you're gonna see the children, um, maybe years from now, speaking here and say, my parent was a recipient of GBI. Mm -hmm. you're, gonna, you're gonna see a lot of uh, students that are going to carry that forward. And a lot of them have been blessed with scholarships. A lot of them have been blessed that they didn't have to work to support their family, that they will extend that down the road and help other families such as ours or um, you know, a lot of families and, and be that resource for them. So I feel like in my role at CSA, I feel like a little wrap around. Um, I, I, you know, if we build that trust, not only did they ask me about GBI, but I, I, they asked me about financial literacy. And a lot of them, this is the first time, maybe about 30 of them, first time they have a debit card. They didn't know how to use it. And so for me to even go step by step to show them how to log online, to them they felt so excited they got to see something new. They no longer have to depend on the next day loans. And so you kind of give them that handout because you're getting them out of that hole where you know, they're constantly living paycheck to paycheck or they're in the negative all the time. So a lot of them, the financial literacy has taken a front step. So in essence, what I see is you're evolving this community and just being um, more present and helping each other. And I think that's my short answer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I see that already. Margaret wanted to jump in. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Um, yes, so uh, I think uh, we do have some criticism. We got a little bit of backlash with uh, folks saying it's a handout. I actually don't call it a handout, but a boost up. And, and, the, and the, the intent, it, it is two years, uh, and there are obviously limitations. And so, um, you know, what can we do in the two years? My hope is that in those two years, the participants who are in the program, our families, will be able to improve their lives, and we'll see that in the data. The first wave of data, I believe, is coming out this summer, so in the next couple of uh, months. So it's on, all on our website. There's a handout here with like a basic uh, information about the program. If you're interested, please take a look. Um, and then the other part of this is to be a part of the, the um, national co growing conversation around UBI and GBI, the mayors for guaranteed income, um, his, his, um, you know, really gr growing this movement 
Um, and uh, we are part of a part of that. And the hope is really to, to go back to policy, your theme, um, look at what policy changes we can make um, to make our, frankly, our current welfare system uh, different, better, and um, able to really um, help people help themselves to improve their lives. So it's really that. It's the, the data collection was very important. Frankly, it costs a little bit more to do, but we thought it was an investment, um, an important investment, because we want it to have lasting effects. And, and that's where the conversation, the policy changes that I advocacy comes into play. And I would also say, just make a plug, you know, we were fortunate as government to have this funding to do this. Um, again, it's finite, uh, but there are uh, companies who have been interested in GPI, ABI programs. Um, so, uh, we've received funding from a, a foundation to help with this work, and so I guess that would be my call to action, is that um, it, you know, it not be just placed on one sector, but really become a community-wide effort, um, since it is uh, you know, really benefiting our entire community. Thank you. So I will bring us uh, to a close. I will mention the, the foundation that supported the city of Mountain View is Silicon Valley Community Foundation. I don't know if Michelle is still here. So thank you. Um, thank you for that investment. Uh, thank you to the panel. I really appreciate the conversation, the wonderful insights. Uh, we are going to take a quick 10, I think, 10, 10 minute break. Thank you, panel. <laughs> <laughs>